Hello world! Welcome to the World Fintech Festival in Finland, brought to you by Helsinki Business Hub, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Nuco Helsinki, Business Finland and us in collaboration with Singapore Fintech Festival. Today we will show you some highlights from the Finnish fintech industry. A few keynotes, a couple of panel discussions and the final pitches of the annual Fintech of the Year competition. We are in Helsinki, the second northernmost capital in the entire world and the capital of the world's happiest country for the third year in a row already. Therefore, I'm really pleased to introduce you as the opening speaker, the mayor of Helsinki, the former vice president of the European Investment Bank, Jan Vapavuori. Welcome to the Helsinki Day at the Singapore Fintech Festival. Our world is undergoing several global transformations simultaneously. Even just one of these transformations would be impactful, but when we consider the combined effects of all of them, we grasp the magnitude of the change we are going through. These transformations, like climate change, digitalization and segregation, are first and foremost present in cities. By 2050, over 70% of the world's population will live in cities and share an urban mindset. Cities are the single system where world's most profound developments, good or bad, will happen. The current COVID crisis will not change any of this. It will highlight many aspects of these transformations and bring to light cities' strengths and weaknesses. There is an opportunity in every crisis. In the current situation, many businesses have thrived. Even in areas where business has completely stopped, some have been able to innovate new ways to create revenue. Many aspects of digitalization and data utilization have taken major steps forward. AI and automatization have become commonplace even in city organizations. Still, I believe that COVID crisis will not create a whole new world of a new normal. It will redirect our use of resources, solidify many ongoing systemic changes, and highlight the need for quick tests and innovations. Fluidity and ability for quick-minded response are the assets for the future. In the post-COVID world, many aspects already associated with the Nordic countries will become necessities. Reliability, safety, openness, clean environment, sustainability and low bureaucracy will make the Nordics a desirable operating environment and a high-valued partner. Helsinki's mission is to be the most functional city in the world. We have done our best to communicate our values and develop our operating environment so that we would be a first choice place and partner for new businesses and investments also, and maybe especially post-COVID. Our city as a service concept aims to attract new talent. We are developing Maria O1 campus at Europe's leading hub for startups. We are making systemic changes to enable public-private partnerships to accelerate smart city solutions. Still, I believe that one major asset behind the world's most functional city is that we are the capital of a nation built on trust. Trust-based society offers high-functioning and high-achieving base for business development and innovation. Transparency, open governance, and equality create an optimal platform for trust to grow. This will be a growing asset, not only for Helsinki, but all Nordic cities in the future. In a post-COVID world, we ask ourselves, what can we learn? How can we build a better world after the crisis? My answer is that in order to restore trust, we must take investment in people seriously. The more we invest in people, the more people are able to trust their society, themselves and each other. The more trust we have, the more efficient and high-functioning the society as whole can be. 
we're able to have less bureaucracy and red tape. People have more time to do what they love, be creative, innovate, lead a better quality of life. Trust makes people less afraid. And when they are less afraid, they participate more, create more, and contribute more. Trust makes societies efficient. In fintech, trust is essential. Building sustainable systems and developing new technologies requires that people and companies are able to trust their security, but also their sense of responsibility. Governments, companies, academia, and NGOs must work together to ensure that building these new systems and innovations actually work towards making life more functional for all. Public sector can do a lot to create optimal platform for growth. Helsinki has opened more data than almost any city in the world. Our digital strategy is based on developing proactive digital services that people actually want to use. Platform economies can flourish due to open information sharing between government, regional actors and companies. Investment in people has created a highly educated workforce. Adaptation to new technologies runs high. Optimal conditions can't, however, ensure success alone. The next step should be a wider global collaboration and more strategic partnerships with international companies and academia. The platform in Helsinki is ready. The regulatory environment is supportive. The ecosystem is supportive. Welcome to Helsinki. I wish you a wonderful day at the Singapore FinTech Festival. Thank you, Jan. At this point, we could have a quick look at how life in Helsinki actually looks like. Helsinki is a famously livable city. But why? Well, for a number of reasons. Ten, to be precise. One, it's close to nature. Helsinki is located on the sea, surrounded by hundreds of islands, and the city is peppered with parks and woodland. Two, everything just works. Visitors are constantly surprised by the ease of city life here. Three, people trust each other. There's a neighborly atmosphere and corruption is virtually non-existent. Four, it's incredibly walkable, with footpaths and excellent jogging routes all around the city center. Five, it's incredibly cyclable, with bike lanes, cycle parking and rentable bikes available everywhere. Six, it's incredibly public transportable, by tram, bus or metro, day or night. Seven, the summers are incredible. And the winters? The winters are... The summers are incredible. Eight, it's a city that knows how to embrace the new. This keeps life interesting. Nine, Helsinki takes care of its citizens and excellent health care and educational facilities can be taken for granted. 10. Overall, it offers superb quality of life. Helsinki is the world's ninth most livable city according to The Economist and constantly ranks highly on Monocle's annual quality of life index. If you liked what you just heard and saw, we have great news for you. Helsinki Business Hub has launched 90 Day Fin Campaign. Through this program, you can apply to become a Fin for three months. Selected entrants will get arranged everything they need to relocate. You find more information from Helsinki Business Hub website or then just Google 90 Day Fin. But do that quickly because the application period will end in a few days. Next, we will take our broadcast to Singapore where we will find our next speakers located at the Ambassador's residence. Riku, are you there? Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to Finland and the rest of the world. I'm Riku Makela from Embassy of Finland in Singapore 
and right now I'm at the residence of Finnish ambassador with four friends of Finland and Fintech. We start with welcoming remarks by Finnish ambassador to Singapore, His Excellency Antti Vanska. Mr. Ambassador, the video stream is yours. Thank you. Yes, hello everybody. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all and open this session in Singapore by saying that Singapore is a very appealing place to do business. There are tens of Finnish companies in Singapore and more than 10,000 European companies. Point companies usually come to Singapore because of a stable and predictable business environment, because of very high level of uh, innovation and education, and because of excellent connections, and of course, uh, high standard of living. So from Singapore, you can uh, cover the rest of Southeast Asia uh, as well. So uh, this is, of course, would not by any means an exhaustive list of reasons. But even du during these COVID times, there's much going on. Singapore is a dynamic place. One of the prime examples is the annually organized FinTech Festival, which gathers tens of thousands of companies from every corner of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Now, Frank Lundqvist started in Singapore in financial sector 36 years ago when he studied the Singapore branch of Finnish bank called Kansali Society Bank in those days. Frank, what could you tell us about Singapore's role in the financial world? During my 36 years working in the financial sector in Singapore, I've seen a tremendous transformation. Singapore is listed as the fifth largest financial center in the world. It is also the second largest wealth management center in the world, jointly with Hong Kong after Switzerland. Uh, total assets under management in Singapore is 4 trillion US dollars, and there are over 200 uh, family offices here in Singapore. Uh, Singapore is also the third largest foreign exchange center in the world after New York and London. Uh, last year the daily average turnover was a staggering 640 billion dollars per day. There are 132 banks in Singapore uh, including all the leading banks, international banks in the world and most of these banks cover the whole of Asia Pacific out of Singapore. Total assets under management by the banks is three trillion dollars. The next thing to come are digital banks operated by non-bank companies. Uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore is about to issue five licenses. Uh, there are currently 21 applicants. Uh, to summarize, the Singapore Financial Centre represents about 13% of Singapore's uh, GDP and employs about 200,000 persons. Uh, to conclude, I would like to mention a word about fintech. There are about a thousand companies in Singapore with 10,000 employees and the firms last year raised about 1 billion US dollars. They're slightly behind to this year, but uh, the figure is still very representative. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Now we move to Sami Jääskeläinen, who is the head of Nordic Innovation House Singapore. Sami, please tell us what is the Nordic Innovation House and how is the ecosystem for fintech and other tech companies here? Yes, so also greetings from my side from sunny Singapore. So Nordic Innovation House is essentially uh, what we call as a community platform which supports and helps and accelerates high quality Nordic tech startups, scale-ups and growth companies that are coming to Singapore 
And of course, many of them are using Singapore as a springboard then for the Southeast Asian markets. Uh, we are a joint Nordic collaboration uh, between the Nordic countries and uh, basically in our Singapore team we have uh, Business Sweden, uh, Innovation Norway, Embassy of Finland and Promote Iceland. Uh, we do have five offices globally these days. Uh, our journey started from Silicon Valley uh, followed by New York and then Singapore and Hong Kong and Tokyo is the latest add-on to our, our network. And then, while we are talking about the fintech, so maybe I highlight a couple of uh, key things from the uh, Singapore fintech ecosystem. So today we have about 40 plus uh, corporate innovation lab operating in fintech space alone. Uh, there are 30 plus different fintech uh, accelerators and in, uh, incubators in Singapore. Uh, obviously, like the regulatory landscape is very, very uh, exciting here and good. Uh, MAS, so the Monetary Authorization of Singapore, is having their uh, regulatory sandbox. They have the uh, API uh, exchange. Uh, Frank was talking about the new banking licenses, which are about to announce in any day these days. And of course, then we have the FinTech Festival, where also Nordic Innovation House were uh, bringing the Nordic FinTech companies last year here in, in Singapore. And maybe the last thing to mention uh, as, a, as a cherry on top of the cake is that uh, Startup Genome just released this week their Global Fintech Ecosystem Report, where Singapore ranked the best in Asia, uh, uh, fourth in globally, uh, just behind uh, Silicon Valley, New York and London. So if you are a Finnish fintech company and want to kick off your Southeast Asia journey in a fintech space, Singapore is the place to start. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. Now we move to Gregory Lingris, who is Managing Director of F-Secure Consulting here in Singapore. Gregory, what would you say about the digital transformation of financial sector in Singapore and Asia based on your uh, large number of clients in that sector? Uh, well, hello everyone. I think it's, it comes as no surprise, right? That's, uh, organizations' digital transformation strategies have really been expedited by the, the pandemic. So uh, what we've seen is a big push by the traditional banking sector to become more digital. And uh, you know their normal processes just aren't efficient anymore, right? So when we look at onboarding through, through face-to-face or in-branch or paper-based, uh, know your clients and anti-money laundering, these processes are just, are just not going to be uh, effective anymore. So uh, they've had to make a big change. And I think you know, that said, there's a lot of innovation happening here as well, right? So, uh, the same panel here has mentioned a few times, but uh, the MAS is arguably one of the most progressive um, central banks in the world, right? And they really look outward to hunt for innovation and technology, and then they assess it and see how they can uh, en enhance this a digital economy with it. So whether it's investing in young fintech businesses, or whether it's looking at blockchain or smart contracts, and now digital banks, right, which will be uh, issued in the next couple of months. So I think these, uh, these new digital banks are going to put a lot of pressure on traditional banking. Right? So they're going to be able to you know, bank the unbanked. They're going to look at gaining a lot of younger generation market share uh, who are very digital. And uh, you know, people who are unhappy with their service providers are going to be able to move so much easier. So uh, it's going to be interesting. I think this new norm of working is going to be around for a while. So the traditional archaic processes by some traditional banks are going to have to change um, if they want to stay relevant, right? Otherwise, we're going to see a big shift towards these digital banks and uh, it's, it's going to make for an exciting time over the next two years. Thank you, Singapore. Before our next speaker, we will have our second infomercial, which is about world ideas in public safety. Finland is one of the safest countries in the world. We are a global superpower in public safety, with some of the world's most innovative companies in critical communications and cybersecurity. We simply know how to keep societies safe, stable and resilient. Today, our vast experience turns into future-minded innovations. Finnish cybersecurity companies provide digital resilience across the society. In public safety, 
Finland offers world-class solutions for preventive action, mission-critical operations and disaster management. Our expertise covers the entire value chain from ideas to execution. In a crisis, every second counts. CCAP offers a platform for secure communication and alerts from any device. Smartphones, legacy phones, Tetra devices and computers. This technology can bypass a device's silent settings and demand instant response, thereby saving critical seconds in a first response situation. Another innovative company, Insta, creates digital solutions that enable smooth collaboration between different public officials in an emergency. This helps them to respond and communicate more effectively. Erega is unique in a world's perspective because it's first uh, nationwide multi-authority emergency response center system that really gets the seamless connectivity between all authorities. Secure mobile connections are more important than ever. Cumacore has created a reliable, software-based mobile packet core to be used in an industrial and critical communications mobile network. Bitium offers ultra-secure smartphones for authorities with the highest security requirements, ensuring encrypted mobile access to sensitive data. Well, utilizing all the features of modern technology, smartphones and broadband data, brings also a lot of risk. The, the attack surface is much bigger when you're using a smartphone and communicating that over commercial networks. Uh, when doing this, you need, our technology makes it possible to, to protect that communication and also protect all the data on the device. Finland is a leading country in public safety. We have the latest technologies, the experts and the digital skills to help make societies across the globe safe and resilient. We believe in world-changing ideas and turning them into global success stories. Finland works for us. Now let it work for you. Business Finland. World Ideas. Related to that topic, our next speaker is truly a world-class cybersecurity expert. He's one of the most recognized tech speakers from Finland globally, and he will be speaking about cybercrime and finance. Welcome Mikko Hyppönen, the Chief Research Officer from F-Secure. Hello and thanks for joining us today. My name is Mikko Hyppönen and I am the Chief Research Officer for F-Secure. F-Secure is one of the largest security companies in Europe and I've been part of the F-Secure story for 29 years now. I joined a small local Helsinki-based startup in 1991 and I'm still working at the same company today. And 29 years is a pretty long time in IT business but it's an especially long time in IT security. When we think about the enemy we used to fight in the early 1990s, it couldn't be more different from the attacks that we see today. Back then, early virus writers were teenage boys who were writing viruses for fun. And when we look at cybercrime today, there's no fun around at all. Almost all of the attacks that we see in our labs around the world are coming from money-making criminals. Money is the thing that makes the world go around. And we started to see the, the first for-profit malware attacks around 2003. And during these years, we've seen a wide range of different kinds of attacks. Pretty much any mechanism we can think of which can be used to make money online is being used by online criminals. Before the internet, we only had to worry about the criminals who were close to us. Today, that doesn't matter at all. Today, the most likely crime that we will become a victim of is no longer a crime in the real world. You see, when we leave the real world and we go to the online world, 
We're no longer in our countries. We are on the internet. We are somewhere which has no borders, has no distances, and has no geography. Internet is the best thing and the worst thing which has happened during our lifetime. Internet is great. It has given us so much good, so much business, so much connectivity, so much entertainment. But it's also exposing us to the kinds of risks we couldn't have imagined. And when we think about technology as a trend or as a, as, as a um, thing that sh shapes our economies and our societies, when technology is good enough, we quickly become dependent on that technology. Eventually, we won't be able to live without that technology. Eventually, our societies won't be able to function with that technology. And I'll give you an example. Electricity. Electricity or the electric grid is obviously taken for granted today, but actually it isn't that old. I'm coming to you from Helsinki, Finland. The first electric grid in this city was made in 1870, which is 150 years ago, which really isn't that long of a time. But during those years, our society, like any society, has become completely dependent on electricity. If you imagine power going out for, let's say, half a year, this society would look completely different. Because without electricity, we can't work, we can't move, we can't make food, we can't heat ourselves. And this kind of a shift is right now underway with internet connectivity. Today, if we lose internet connectivity, it's pretty bad, it's a nuisance, but clearly it doesn't shut down our societies. However, eventually it will. In 20 years, in 30 years, we'll be exactly as reliant on internet connectivity as we are today reliant on electric grid. In fact, I claim that eventually, if the internet goes out, the power will go out. That's how interdependent these systems will eventually become. And the job of us security people is to try to prevent that from happening. And this isn't an easy job to do, because when we do our work, when we try to prevent attacks from happening, it's sort of like playing a game of Tetris. Security Tetris. What do I mean? Well, we all know the game of Tetris. We know the rules. We are trying to build these whole lines. And when we succeed, the success, the whole line disappears. So our successes disappear, but our failures pile up. This is what my job looks like. Whenever we succeed in what we are trying to do, nothing happens. If we are 100% successful, nothing is going to happen. However, if we fail, then it's very visible. If we fail, the end result is data breaches, data leaks, malware outbreaks, front page news. That's just the line of our business. We are invisible until we fail. And when we look at the failures that are going on around us today, these attacks are being fueled by online criminals. Criminals who try to gain access to our corporate networks and our enterprise, enterprise systems to gain access to financial data, to lock our systems with ransom trojans, to launch denial of service attacks, to take down our online shops and then demand a blackmail payment, or ransom trojans which lock systems. Any mechanism which can be used to make money is being used to make money. And when we think about particular problems, like, for example, banking trojans that's a great example on how the attackers will go after the weakest targets banking trojans have been around for years however these malicious malware systems which are targeting banks don't actually try to infect the bank's own systems no 
they try to infect the bank's customers' systems. Why is this? Because banks put a lot of effort into safeguarding and securing their own networks. They run these extensive mainframe-based systems, which are very hard to breach. So the attackers typically don't even try. If you are an attacker, if you want to break into a bank and steal a million dollars, you can either try to break into the bank itself, which is very hard, but if you succeed, you'll get your million, or you can try to gain access to the systems of the bank's customers. For example, home computers, which are really easy targets because they run Windows XP and have no firewall. However, if you gain access to a single home system, obviously you won't be able to steal a million because they don't have a million, but they might have a thousand dollars. And if you have a thousand victims, that's one thousand times one thousand, that's a million. This is why we see banking Trojans going after home systems or systems of small and medium-sized companies. If they can't steal a lot of money, then they need a lot of victims. Unfortunately, it's easy for them to make a lot of victims. And banking Trojans get the money by inserting extra transactions into real banking sessions. So you go online to pay three bills, but when you're actually paying your bills, you end up paying four bills. You just don't see the fourth bill on your bill on your screen. It's in, inserted automatically by a Trojan running on your computer. And when we look at enterprise systems, it's crucial that the computers being used by companies that are the particular ones which are used to, to pay the bills for that company are safeguarded because those particular systems are the key systems for banking Trojan attackers. Another huge trend underway are ransom Trojans. Ransom Trojans don't try to steal anything. Instead, they lock you out of your own data. They encrypt your files, then they demand a payment from you in order to get a key, a decryption key, which will give you your own files back. And ransom Trojans are using a, a very old idea, which we've seen in malware and malicious attacks for years and years. The idea is that you steal valuable information and then you sell that information to the highest bidder. You steal information, you sell it to the highest bidder. We've seen this for years and years. And the innovation in Ransom Trojans was that the attackers realized that quite often the highest bidder is the original owner of the information themselves. You steal the information, then you sell the information back to the original owners. You lock companies out of their own files and they will pay you money to get their own files back. This is what ransom Trojans do. And the real explosion which made ransom Trojans the biggest malware problem around right now started seven years ago when we saw a ransom Trojan called Crypto Wall, which was the first Trojan which was demanding the payment to be done in this new currency called Bitcoin. Bitcoin, which is now more than 10 years old, quickly found use within the criminal underground. And today, all ransom Trojans demand the payment in Bitcoin because it's much harder to track the money movements in the blockchain network created by Bitcoin than in any other payment mechanisms. This, of course, doesn't mean that Bitcoin would be criminal or bad. It's a tool. It's a tool which can be used for good or for bad. And today, some ransom Trojan families are so targeted that they might even uh, pick specific business lines to go after. For example, we're right now seeing attacks from the Egregor ransom Trojan family, which is especially targeting uh, retail chains and cashier systems. So far that when it infect, infects a cashier network, it will print out the ransom note from the cashier systems themselves. There's an endless line of a ransom note coming from the cashier system which explains how to pay the ransom if you want to get your systems back into use. And right now we are seeing the next shift, a shift which I call ransomware version 2. This shift is happening because companies are getting better in recovering from ransom Trojan attacks. 
companies have realized that they really need to have good backups, backups which are frequent enough, which cover all the data, and which are stored offline, so a ransom trojan in the network won't be able to corrupt the backups. Slowly but surely, companies have learned, and this means that less and less companies need to pay the ransom to get their own files back because they now have good enough backups. And this has created ransomware version 2. Attackers are now using mechanisms where you have to pay the ransom even if you have the backups. This was innovated first by a ransomware gang known as Maze, which operates from Moscow in Russia. In January of 2020, they introduced a leak site. They have a website just for the purpose of leaking information stolen from their victim companies. So they will hit your network, encrypt your files, demand a payment, but if you don't pay, then they will tell you that before we encrypted your stuff, we copied your email server and your document servers, and we will post these on the public web if you don't pay. And in those cases, your backups don't help you at all. Your backups don't help at all. And this mechanism has now been copied by seven different ransomware gangs, which all use now leak sites. Leak sites, which, for example, look like this. This is the leak site for the Mount Locker ransomware gang. And if ransomware is the biggest money-making mechanism for malware, it's not the biggest money-making mechanism overall. Because even more money is being made by criminals specializing in business email compromise attacks. Business email compromise attacks, also known as CEO scams, have been around forever. Some will remember that these fake bills were being faxed to the companies already in the 1990s in hoping that some summer intern would just stupidly go and pay any bill which was being faxed to a company. The attacks we see today are basically using the same idea, trying to fool a company into paying bills which don't exist or paying real bills to wrong addresses or wrong places, to wrong accounts. And whenever these cases hit the headlines, a very typical reaction from people is to laugh about it. Like, what an idiot falling for some Nigerian scam, or how stupid do you have to be to send the company's money to some faraway place? Well, that's wrong. First of all, it's wrong to laugh at the victims of crimes. Second of all, avoiding these problems isn't easy at all. It's not that simple anymore. I can name you two companies which were hit with multi-million dollar business email compromise last year. You might know them. Google and Facebook. Both were hit with multi-million dollar hits and they actually were, were wiring, wiring money out in millions. And these companies know what they're doing. These companies have extensive security mechanisms. These companies train their employees, especially their financial employees, to prevent things like these. They still fell for it. It's not an easy problem. In many of these cases, the attackers first gain access to the corporate network, especially Office 365 or other email systems, so they can follow the email traffic of the company and learn how do things work. Like who creates the bills? How are they transferred? How are they authenticated? Who pays the bills? Who do they talk to if the account numbers change? They learn that first, and once they know everything, then they start inserting extra emails into the traffic. Those emails are coming from internal email server. They look just like any other emails. So for example, CFO sends a bill to a clerk, and a minute later, the same CFO sends a correction. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong PDF. Here's the right PDF, please use this. And of course, the modified PDF has a different account number. These are complicated attacks. And this summer we saw the Norwegian state fund being targeted by one of these attacks. They lost 100 million kroner in this particular attack. And then when the real recipients of the payments who weren't getting their payments were emailing Norfund asking for guidance, like where's the money, what's happening? 
the crooks saw these emails and they replied to them in the name of the company, explaining to them that uh, unfortunately the payments are delayed. This is because of the global pandemic, we're sure you understand. Which is a pretty good cover story. These attacks which make money continue to be the biggest problem and they're almost always done by organized crime. But they're not always done by organized crime. When we look at nation states as attackers, countries like Russia or China or Iran constantly do attacks for the purpose of espionage or for the purpose of sabotage. However, there's also one country which does nation-state attacks for financial gain. There's one country only which does that, and that country is North Korea. There's only one country on the planet which tries to fix their budget deficit by stealing from other countries with cyber attacks. We've seen this multiple times from attacks coming from North Korea, including, most famously, the WannaCry attack, which was a ransomware Trojan created and deployed by a government. Let me repeat that. It's a ransomware Trojan created and deployed by a government, not by a crime group, by a government. And we've seen multiple attacks from North Korea targeting international payment systems or targeting cryptocurrency exchanges. And especially cryptocurrency attacks make a lot of sense when you think about a country which is being um, which is being sanctioned from all, almost all over the world. Sanctions help when you're trying to shut down traffic with dollars or euros or rubles. Sanctions don't help with cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies don't care about your sanctions. So it makes a lot of sense that the attackers in countries like these go after cryptocurrency exchanges. And we've seen many of these attacks, which we attribute back to North Korea and to North Korean government. We have some details about this in a recent paper we put out about the cyber threat landscape for the financial sector. So like I said, we are playing a never-ending game of security, security Tetris, where our successes disappear, but our failures pile up. And we are playing this game in middle of massive technological revolutions where digitalization is changing the whole world. And when technology becomes good enough, when technology becomes useful enough, we just can't live without it anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikko. Now I understand that you were once the backup speaker for Barack Obama. I would like to now take the broadcast to our commentators to the studio of Fintech Daydreaming, where we have our heavyweight financial industry experts sharing some of their wisdom related to the topic. Paul and Ville, are you there? Hello and welcome to the Fintech Daydream Studio here at the beautiful suburb of Espoo, Finland. My name is Ville Sointu and my day job is the head of emerging technologies for Nordea Bank. Uh, Nordea Bank is the largest financial institution in the Nordic countries, but this of course is something that you already knew being Fintech fans there in the audience today. Uh, my other job uh, is to be a co-host for this, uh, I, I guess I could say mildly popular uh, Fintech podcast called Fintech Daydreaming. Uh, Fintech Daydreaming is a bi-weekly podcast that tries to find the balance between really, truly horrible jokes uh, and fintech topics. Right, Paul? Absolutely. And I am Paul Krogdahl, the other half of the Fintech Daydreaming team. And my day job, I am a CTO and industry technical leader for IBM, focused on the financial services industry. I sit as the CTO for the Global Core Banking and Payments ISV practice for IBM and work with some of the largest banks in the world, such as Nordea here in the Nordics. And along with Villa, 
I co-host this podcast looking into the world of uh, fintech companies and banking technologies. Now, one cornerstone of the uh, show that we have is the bad jokes we read out uh, at the beginning of every episode that are sent in to us by listeners. And I suppose it would be a complete disappointment for us to not have one this time as well. Right, Villa? Right. So, Villa, here is a joke that has been sent in to us by a listener in uh, the US. Okay, cool. Yeah. And uh, the joke is, where does Santa keep his money? Well, I would hope in Nordea Bank, but I guess you're going to tell me something different. In a snowbank. Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess, uh, I guess we, the, uh, the viewers now have a bit of a taste on, on what, what it is like to record podcasts with you uh, on, on a bi-weekly basis. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. But, so, Villa, I wonder... Um, is this an honor for us to have been invited to this show as uh, the fintech comedians? <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I think either way, we'll take it. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think that there's too many fintech comedians out there, period. Uh, but, you know, it's an absolute uh, uh, pleasure to, to be able to do this. I think it's, uh, it should be fun. But right now, we just saw uh, a, a great presentation by Mikko Hyppanen uh, about, uh, about uh, security uh, in the modern digital ecosystem. Uh, I, I really liked his uh, kind of analogy on, on, the, on the kind of uh, information security Tetris, basically, mm -hmm. that all the successes kind of disappear uh, and uh, uh, the things that you fail in uh, mount up uh, in the, on the bottom of the pile and they are highly visible. And this actually reminded me of, uh, of a blockchain joke uh, that I, uh, that I uh, heard one day, which was that the, uh, did you hear about the blockchain gaming company uh, that failed? No, absolutely not. Yeah, they were trying to make Tetris, but they couldn't make the blocks disappear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I really just had to squeeze that in there. Uh, but anyway, I think uh, what what uh, what Mikko was talking about is actually quite relatable. Uh, mm -hmm. It's in, especially in the banking industry. It's uh, it's quite clear that uh, whenever everything is just working fine, uh, nobody will notice. But it, it, when anything goes wrong, especially in the domain of information security, it's close to a cataclysmic event, uh, of course, because we are tasked uh, to pe keep people's money safe. Now, Paul, uh, your, your day job as, as the CTO of a major technology company, I guess, uh, can we blame you for all the problems now? Well, Villa... <laughs> Not sure exactly <laughs> what aspect you would like to blame on the larger technology companies here, right? The security issue um, is, is everybody's issue, right? And um, I, I think at the end of the day, security is something we all have a responsibility for. The banks uh, need to help their clients to stay safe. And I think that technology companies have a duty to help the banks to keep their customers' data and the transactions uh, safe as well. I mean, we need to remember that uh, there will always be bad customers in the world. And, and it is our responsibility as corporations to try and stay one step ahead of these cyber criminals. Um, and that goes for both the tech companies and the banks. I actually like the analogy that Miko used looking at the internet and our growing dependency on it uh, in you know, relationship to the, the electrical grid. Yeah. That is absolutely spot on. And we're getting more and more dependent on online services. The days of banking getting done face to face in a branch office you know, and, and all the transactions being kept on paper and, and in a book are, are long gone. Mm. Um, and if we were to shut down the Internet, I wonder how long it would take for the global economy to basically just freeze up. Yeah, exactly. I guess I will accept your uh, explanation there on the on the blame. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm still not sure, though. Uh, we'll get back to that uh, l later on. Absolutely. We should. 
but okay, what we're all here for uh, is to see uh, some Finnish fintech companies tell their stories about how they are going to change the world of finance. I'm setting up my bingo card here uh, and I actually have some keywords. AI, blockchain, central bank, digital transformation, corona crisis and financial inclusion. So what do you think, Paul? Uh, are we going to hit bingo in the, in the first five seconds or in the, in the next five minutes? I definitely think the uh, buzzword bingo will be flashing all of the uh, bright red lights uh, during these sections, right? Um, so from the Fintech Daydreaming Studio, back to you, Yama. Thank you guys and talk to you soon. At Fintech Farm, we are on a mission to develop the Finnish fintech industry and there are pretty awesome stuff coming up all the time. Before we look in more particular into the companies we have, let's have a look at the foundation the fintech in Finland is built on. Fintech of the Year award has been handed out since 2018 and actually the previous winners Enfuse and P3 Cloud Asset will be joining us later today in the panel. But now it's time to have a look at this year's finalists. The finalists were selected in a public poll by our audience and they will be now pitching to our judges who are Rika Salminen from the payment giant Visa, Andre Rodin from leading European bank BNP Paribas and Toby Lywood from Ox a venture capital firm in London. After the pitches, the judges will have a serious discussion and then they will finally, hopefully, announce the winner at the end of this event. So now, let's get started with the finalists who are Receipt Hero, Tomorrow Tech, Valega Chain Analytics, Voima Gold and Roy Financial Technologies. Hello, my name is Joel and I'm the founder and CEO in Receipt Hero. We are solving a global problem and ecological disaster called paper receipts. But before diving into the problem, I would like to introduce our team. And uh, regarding our team, we just raid, uh, raised a seed round of 2 million. So we are not looking for money at the moment, but looking for impactful A round investors who would like to participate on the next round. What comes to our team, uh, we are all serial tech entrepreneurs, uh, ex uh, background in, in fintech and SaaS. Uh, before we uh, founded um, Receipt Hero, we established a company called Etasku, which is uh, now being acquired by Accounter Group, and Etasku is today the most used uh, travel expense management software in Finland. Okay, into the problem. Uh, when we talk about digital receipts, we are not talking about uh, email receipts or images or PDF files. We are talking about structured SKU level receipt data from API from systems to systems. So that's quite important to remember. And uh, how Receipt Hero works in practice, uh, it's very simple. Uh, you just pay with your payment card in any of the Receipt Hero enabled locations and we deliver the receipt data automatically 
into your banking, account, uh, banking uh, application or travel expense management software. So what you need to do is just pay with your payment card and receipt data flows automatically into your banking account and banking application. And what we have built in the background, so we have API platform for merchants so that they can easily push the receipt data into our platform. And then we have partner API for banking applications, loyalty schemes, uh, accounting softwares, so that they can easily get the receipt data from our APIs. So we are basically in the middle of every uh, banking application and um, challenger bank and fintech. When there's a payment transaction, there should be a receipt and we are delivering those receipts on those applications. Uh, Today, uh, before uh, end of 2020, we have over 2,000 merchants uh, integrated into our system on the merchant sites. We have lots of global um, partners like Verifone and um, CGI on the PSP and point of sale side. And then we have banking applications and partners like uh, Nordic lar largest bank, Nordea, and SAB with their Eurocard products. So what we are building on top of the receipt data, there's lots of things that we can do um, that can be a, a better customer feedback or reviews so that you can tap in um, feedback from your banking app or we can do card links loyalty or, or extended warranties or there's lots of opportunities on, on receipts that we can do. So the market that we have we have estimated for, for digital receipts will be huge in the coming years. Um, we have estimated based on the business tracks that we have that digital receipts will be over 30 billion market in, in the coming years. So key highlights from my presentation is that um, we have a 30 billion market. We have highly uh, experienced management team we already have the technology in place um, and the platform has been built and the receipts are flowing from merchants to banking applications and we have proved our business model to be working. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eero Talonen. Let me present to you a revolutionary fintech, Tomorrow Tech. Uh, we are uh, a digital product studio of 10 people with exceptional skill in getting things done. And here are some examples of just that. Um, it was late 2018. Uh, we were working with six banks, with real estate agents and uh, the Finnish government. And we had a problem that we need to establish a common process for selling apartments that have paper share certificates. And uh, what the, uh, one of the biggest real estate agencies told us is that there's no way we can trade paper shares digitally. So we got to work. And in June 2019, the trading had started. And by the way, we were working with six rival banks here and, and got them working together. So in order to finance this platform and to better commit the key stakeholders to the platform, we decided it's best to establish a joint venture with the banks. Uh, we pitched this idea to our lawyers and uh, who had experience of, of similar endeavors and, and they told us that there's no way you'll get this done. Uh, but we got to work and, the, uh, and then in uh, three months the contracts had been signed and we had a joint venture for Diaz and Tomorrow, Te Tomorrow Tech, by the way, was still the main, <laughs> main owner there. Uh, so Diaz is currently our main product. Um, it is a digital trading platform for the Finnish residential uh, market, uh, real estate market, and it is a platform that changes the way we buy and sell apartments. The vision for, for the platform from the start has been to enable the selling and buying of uh, apartments within minutes rather than the, potentially the weeks that it takes nowadays without Diaz. So once a real estate agent has a buyer for the apartment, uh, the 
realtor can just click a button in their own software and send it to Diaz and after that Diaz takes care of the whole process automatically rather than for the realtor to start calling the banks, calling the buyer, seller, set up a meet uh, for everyone to meet at the same place at the same time and so on, scan documents and so on. So Diaz takes care of that automatically. Uh, the banks check contracts with algorithms. The only manual step ac actually there is that for a buyer and seller to sign digitally. And after that, Diaz takes care of the payments and transfer of ownership automatically. And this is actually something we have in production right now. Uh, there are still some manual steps involved. So it takes from hours to usually to days because, for instance, the payments are handled manually by the banks and then confirmed in Diaz. The business model is that the realtor and the banks pay for each successful transaction. We have 99% of the Finnish mortgage market on board. The platform is actually based on blockchain technology and uh, thus we have uh, nodes for, for all of the banks. Uh, then in addition, the platform provides APIs for the realtors to integrate with and in addition, Dias is integrated with, with the tax authority uh, in Finland and in the future, the National Land Survey. And we do have pretty much all of the important systems on board. As said, this has been a collaboration that brought together an industry as well as the government. And to highlight the significance of this, I, I have some articles from the biggest newspaper in Finland that wrote about us over the years, so a collaboration like this hasn't, see, hasn't been seen between the banks since the 1990s. In 2018, this platform is unlike anything we have in the Nordics or in the world. In 2019, once we got to production, uh, trades are happening every day, and now today, Dia's market share is more than 20% after being in production since last year's June. The issues in real estate trading are similar everywhere. And we have reached break even in Finland. But we know that there's apartment sales going on all around the world. So we are now looking for the next market areas to focus on. And I would be happy to discuss with you further. So please contact me. Lastly, the team behind it all the brilliant individuals who get things done. Thank you. We actually failed our first blockchain company. Uh, we had entered a very unregulated market and uh, it was basically a wild west where we were very naive. We saw the rise of criminal activities happening. We saw that there were not enough uh, tools to actually track and prevent these kind of ha happenings from, from taking place. And we saw that banks and other financial institutions were actually at risk. However, this was about to change with the fifth anti-money laundering directive. It made sure that people needed to actually know where the money was coming from and monitor these transactions. So we decided to pivot and we created a financial compliance platform. Here, companies could connect and really get the automated risk scoring, real-time transaction monitoring, and even do reporting to the law, law enforcement and other financial authorities. We can get account balances and more using this platform. We're also working on actually getting crypto to fiat transactions being monitored for banking. We built a Pathfinder. It's a decentralized transaction graph, which allows us to conduct live investigations, track the flow of assets, and really like this follow the money trail to try and catch perpetrators. We tested this actually this summer. First, with a Twitter hack, we were the first company in the world to actually provide some information about what was going on, as well as with a big Finnish hack that has been happening with the mental health institution, Vastamo, and we have been working quite a lot with that. Our business model is simple. We are software as a service, B2B and banks. Uh, we white label our solutions towards uh, accounting firms and other consultancy firms, and we do a case by case for cybersecurity and government professionals. The market is growing. We're looking at something like $60 billion uh, worth of governments and risk um, 
assessment tools uh, coming in the next few years. And the World Health Organization, I mean, the, sorry, the World Economic Organization has actually said that Bitcoin and blockchain will be household names in the coming years. We do have some competitors out there. However, we're actually catering to the mass adoption of cryptocurrencies and towards the masses. So we feel that we're more user friendly and we are at a lower cost than the rest. We have some cool achievements. We were the first company with crypto to actually be backed up by Business Finland. We were the innovation pitch winner in Tallinn in 2019. Uh, we are in negotiations with Fortune 500 companies. We were part of the prestigious Accelerator Frankfurt this year. We're getting new clients every month. And we were the strongest team at the Game of Ideas uh, in, in Finland this year, as well as we were in the most interesting companies in the Helsinki FinTech. Our team is actually built out of um, several tech entrepreneurs, financial entrepreneurs, as well as major uh, compliance officers from the biggest companies, as well as cryptographers. We did close a successful seed round this year uh, from three different countries, and that allows us to automate our systems, bring in machine learning to a next level within our technology, as well as scale up in, in Europe and do better uh, with a Swift for blockchains, which is something we are building right now. And we're working for the Series A in the next 12 months, where we're looking for both partners as well as expansion into the Asian markets, which are really, really growing due to new regulations coming up. All right, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Marko Viinikkan, I'm CEO and founder of Voima Gold, and we do gold-based banking. It all started in 2008 when I was working as a, as a, a financial brokerage company, as an assistant, and the financial crisis came. And I asked my uh, supervisors and older colleagues that what was happening, because the market started quite quickly uh, recovering. And they answered that the uh, uh, central bank started to print money, and I questioned myself that was there too little money in the world? And as a son of farmer, the answer didn't uh, really uh, uh, satisfy me. And la at the later stage, I was in charge of uh, uh, 40 different client portfolios, and I was managing them, and the euro crisis hit in at the later stage. And I draw a liability map for all of my customers' liabilities, what, what, what kind of risks, risks they were facing, and after drawing this liability map, I could not work anymore. I was unable to attract new clients and, uh, and really uh, perform well. So I decided that uh, I asked the question myself that why should I care about it? Because other financial industry does not think about it. So basically I started thinking these uh, 40 individual clients and their future, what would happen to them, because I knew them really well, what would happen to them if, the, if the, some of these liabilities would go down. So I uh, figured out that their future matters and doing the, uh, working hard and doing the right thing really matters. So the problem one is that people lose wealth every day because new money is added to economy endlessly and this decreases the purchasing power of money. So here you can see uh, the rise of uh, Federal Reserve balance sheet. It's same in other uh, major fiat currencies as well. Gold fixes this. With uh, thousands of years of stability, the gold has been able to stay valuable while the other uh, currencies have crashed one after another. The another problem is that the customers don't own their hard-earned money in their bank account. Basically, the bank owns it juridically, even though that you will control it, uh, the banks own it. And many customers are really unaware of this, and it brings risk without decent compensation because interest rates are either zero or negative. So basically, by the European uh, Central Bank regulations, only 1% of the assets is, uh, is uh, required to keep in the bank. So if I deposit 100 euro to my bank account, bank can lend 99 euros uh, to consumer credit, mortgage, business finance, and government bonds. And this brings risk for me because uh, household debt is all time high, and municipal debt is all, all time high, Corporate debt is all-time high, government debt is all-time high. And usually, after this kind of events, uh, some people fail, and now it's uh, my money at the bank is at the risk. 
But our product Loima account is the solutions because uh, we don't bank euros, we bank gold. It physically exists on own uh, built story uh, vault in, in, in Helsinki and they're quarterly audited by PwC. And it's 100% insert and uh, we have over 100% gold reserves. And the goal in the account is the purest uh, form possible. Today we are purpose driven team uh, up to, to 20 people based in Helsinki. We have over 2,000 uh, customers from over 20 countries. We have fully documented and audited processes, and we have in-house security, legal, ESG, design, and I IT, to name a few. Uh, we, uh, our revenue this year is about 20 million euros, and next year we will be uh, cash flow positive. Tomorrow, we will, uh, so basically at the future, we will uh, integrate SWIFT payments to our Voima account and insta uh, insert also credit card like Visa or MasterCard to this. And we will also start offering Euro credit to all uh, of our clients. And our mission is to be the safest bank in the world and lead the change to gold-based financial services. And for service is for those who want their purchasing power to last through this time and for the generations to come. And if you want to know more, go www.voimagold.com and, and, and learn about more about our purpose, mission, vision, and financing situation. We, don't have we are not currently raising, but we're looking for partners, and at the later stage, we will raise uh, around. Thank you. Bye now. After selling my part of my first company, I got extra money and I was thinking, what should I do? I signed up to a trading platform and felt overwhelmed. The service was clearly not made for a consumer like me. This was the starting point of Roy, an easy app with financial learning programs and investing tool. The gatekeepers of Wall Street have been committed to keeping the masses at bay. The male-dominated finance industry is missing out more than $700 billion a year in revenue by failing to listen or tailor product for females. We teach often underserved group of consumers to take their finances on their own hands. The feature called Roy Trainer helps consumers to gain knowledge from everyday budgeting to trading. The accessible bite-sized modules and live webinars help consumers learn the basic financial know-how and embedded deeper financial tools such as budgeting tool, compound interest calculator and personal income statement and balance sheets are another way to widen participation, providing more consumers with the financial support they need throughout life. The best part is that we offer Roy Trainer to consumers as well as companies so that they can offer it to employees as a financial well-being service. Besides learning programs, Roy is an investment platform that offers a wide range of investment products, from stocks to ETFs. Roy's twist lies in its integration of social components into the traditional investing process, which is called the team trade model. The company's C2B bulk trading model easily creates huge orders for the stocks and ETFs and leaves more room to cut trading prices. By sharing Roy product information on social networks such as WatchApp, users can invite their contacts to form a trading team to get a lower price for their trade. The lowering price mechanism coupled up with other incentives such as lottery for a free trade, Roy manages to acquire users at a very low cost. Combined with that extra satisfaction of scoring a good deal with your friends and, of course, other users as a team, Roy soon becomes a viral sensation in Europe. Yes, we know that the revelation that bulk buying means lower prices will probably not shake you to your core. 
where competitors take a hands-off anonymous approach to bulk trades, Roy incentivizes consumers to get involved and try prices down themselves. In a sense, Roy uses the network effects of social media to give this age-old practice a 2020 makeover. Roy is about using social networking to connect with like-minded investors with clear benefits to reaching out as many people as possible. Through social sharing, users are sending investment information precisely to friends and groups that may have similar income and investment strategy preferences. Partnering up with the industry leaders, we are able to offer users stocks and ETFs in 135 different markets, while most of our competitors are only offering US and UK equities. Roy has a strong and gender diverse team with relevant expertise, and we also have diversity in experience. I worked together with Yana, our sales director, already in my first company in 2015. Now she is leading the sales of our B2B software as a service with great success. Also, our tech team has previously worked in the same company and developed respirator software in highly regulated healthcare segment, among many other things. Our team consists of multiple successful serial entrepreneurs, so pressure and overcoming challenges is not particularly new to us. Our advisors include Tuomas, the founder of Holvi, super lawyer Marcus, and of course our lovely shareholder Lisa, who has previously worked in the Finnish Financial Supervisory Authority for over 12 years. We already have a hiring funnel too. With the help of Seed Round, we are able to product our team with compliance officer, marketing manager, and two senior software engineers. And of course, grow our monthly recurring revenue to 100k. Yes, we are raising right now. If you got interested to hear more about the round, please do not hesitate to contact us. This is Roy. We want to make financial well-being and investing available for the rest of us. My name is Ida Mantu. I am the founder and CEO of the company. Thank you. Fantastic. That was all the five finalists. We will know the winner in an hour or so, but now let's jump, jump back to our commentator studio. What are your thoughts, Paul and Ville? Wow, thank you, Yana. A lot of fantastic pitches there. Now, Villa, who would have known that we had so many fantastic fintechs up here in uh, the frozen north of Finland, right? <laughs> Indeed. Um, much going on in the fintech space here. Uh, now, I'm not sure I would be able to select which one was the best one out of those. Uh, we'll get to find out later, right, from mm. the, uh, the, uh, the judges. Um, I think they all had some fantastic ideas, though, and solutions. And nice to see some of our close associates and, uh, and friends in some of those pitches. They weren't actually presenting themselves, but they were listed as part of the organizations. Um, and I think some of them have been um, guests on our uh, previous episodes. Um, Kia Finlow Bates was uh, a guest on our last episode, yeah. right? Yeah. Talking about uh, blockchain <laughs> and the weather, yes. Um, not sure how we did on our bingo card, but I'm pretty sure we completed them. How about you, Villa? I guess uh, the only word I, I, I'm looking for here is bingo. Uh, and really, it was, uh, it was a buzzword bingo there. Uh, but after seeing all those pitches, uh, I gotta say, uh, not all of them are the same, but they do rhyme. Uh, and I, th I think actually collaboration uh, is the common factor here. Absolutely. I think collaboration is, is super critical. 
did I hear blockchain in there a few times? It isn't blockchain supposed to have changed everything just a few years back? Yeah, I think uh, just to put everything on the blockchain and uh, then the world peace will happen and uh, every, all the problems yes. will disappear magically. Yep. Now, the blockchain has delivered some things though. Uh, for example, it, it has delivered me a plentiful supply of socks. So I have Ripple socks on me today. Uh, so You've also got some IBM blockchain socks, right? I do, and I do also R3 quarter socks. I have plenty of socks. I think I even Fantastic. have uh, Quorum socks. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I think I'm set for socks for, for mm. a lifetime now. So thank you blockchain for that. But, uh, but there's another bad blockchain joke I, I gotta tell you. So okay. I, I'm, I'm gonna pre-apologize for this, but uh, I think we have to kind of uh, keep our reputation of bad jokes going. So uh, do you know why uh, the restaurant industry uh, is uh, hesitant to, to get on the blockchain? No, but I'm sure you're gonna tell me. They are worried that they will be stuck with a single source of truth. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, and I pre-apologize, so I'm not going to do that again. Listeners, what do you think to that one? L let us know. But <laughs> from my personal perspective, Villa, um, I have a strong opinion that the banks need to change their focus from the traditional product-based business models that we are actually very used to and adopt a more customer-centric view. So put the customer at the center rather than the uh, products as they have done to date. I have written a lot of blogs and delivered several keynote uh, presentations on this. As, as you know, Villa, we've had a lot of discussions about this in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, a key element in this transition is for the banks to find new revenue models that are not based on margins that are embedded into their products, but, but focus more on uh, possibly a subscription-based model based on tailored advisory services to their clients. I talk a lot about the, the data enabled client uh, in this context. So with that in mind, I did find the pitch from uh, Rui, or, or Roy, Roy yeah. uh, extremely interesting and refreshing. But Villa, I, I noticed one of the guests pitches was from uh, Tomorrow Tech. Yeah. Um, Weren't you involved in, in that somehow through Nordea? I was indeed. Uh, I, I distinctly remember the, uh, the time when uh, the guys from Tomorrow Tech came over to Nordea and uh, we went to have a lunch at the, uh, at the local sushi restaurant and uh, I was sold uh, on their vision uh, mm -hmm. and their, their kind of eager and eager approach to uh, building something truly new and decentralized uh, in form of a, of a distributed ledger techno technology enabled uh, network for uh, real estate trading or re residential uh, real estate trading uh, in Finland. And uh, indeed, uh, the, the CEO uh, of Tomorrow Tech is uh, Sami Honkonen. Uh, he's, uh, he was a guest in our podcast. Another uh, guest, yes. And uh, I think he was in, actually in season one, uh, one of the earlier episodes mm. uh, we did. And uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's an interesting character for sure. Uh, we talked a lot about death metal bands, which is uh, another common feature of the, uh, of the Finnish kind of uh, landscape. Uh, there's a lot of uh, snow and uh, darkness and uh, death metal bands. So I think they all go together uh, somehow, somehow nicely. And ice swimming. Ice, oh, yes, indeed. Yes. Swimming in the ice cold uh, sea is, is one of the uh, traits of the, of the Finns as well, yeah. uh, in addition to the other stuff like sauna and Santa Claus, obviously. But hey, uh, again, fantastic pitches, a lot of friends out there. Uh, and even we, we did some, even though we did some really bad jokes here, uh, I think uh, we got through this uh, segment uh, with, with lifted minds. Yes. Now, Jan, back to the studio. Great comments, guys. We'll see a bit later what our actual judges were thinking. Before we go to our panel, well, let's have a quick look at why Finland is a technology superpower. Digital technologies are revolutionizing the way we experience the world. Finland is at the forefront of this revolution. Our secret is a unique government-supported ecosystem where companies, research facilities and universities form a tight-knit community. 
Finland has recently been ranked number one in the world in university industry collaboration. Our large amount of open data and supportive legislation create a strong foundation for new digital services and AI technologies, leading us to the era of platform economy. The development of augmented and virtual reality innovations is supported by highly developed electronics and camera technologies. The gaming industry provides us with programming skills and platforms to create even more imaginative technologies. One of these innovations is Varius headset that uses a bionic display technology that mimics the characteristics of the human eye. It lets you see things in the virtual world just as clearly as you see them in the real world. The VR and AR technologies in the future will revolutionize the way that people use technology. So instead of using a computer merely through a monitor, you can actually step inside the experience and it's all around you. The Finnish critical communications are among the fastest and most reliable in the world. Our authorities form a strong network together with an innovative cluster of businesses and are quick to adopt the latest technologies. F-Secure is one of the leading experts in cybersecurity, both in Finland and internationally. We are the first generation in mankind's history who are living our lives here in the real world, but also in the online world. And that's what makes cybersecurity such an important topic. So why Finland? We have the technology expertise, the digital ecosystems and the creative spirit to be a real technology superpower. We believe in world-changing ideas and turning them into global success stories. Finland works for us. Now let it work for you. Business Finland. World Ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to World Fintech Festival Finland on my behalf as well. My name is Teppo Havo and I'm head of startups, growth and sustainability in Danske Bank Finland. But today, today I have the honor of facilitating this panel, uh, sustainability as a driver for successful Nordic fintechs. The topic is extremely imp uh, interesting and so are our guests. So let's uh, let's see who we have on board today. A warm welcome to Pekka Sivonen, Exe Executive Director, Digi uh, Digital Transformation of Finnish Industries from Business Finland. Welcome. Ilona Kivimäki, Business Dev Development uh, Director of Sustainability Services from Enfuse. Welcome, Ilona. And then Hasan Malik, CEO and founder from P3 Cloud Asset. We have remote, con uh, re uh, remote connection from Pakistan, actually. Good to have you on board. Thanks, Teppo. Nice to be here with you guys. Excellent. Great to have you all on board. And uh, now let's have a short introductional round. Uh, and uh, let's start with uh, Ilona here. One minute. Please be, please be brief here. Okay. We only have 30 minutes. Sure. Uh, my name is Ilona from Enfuse. We are a global and innovative uh, payment service provider uh, based in the Nordics. The company was established in 2016. Our core business areas are um, card issuing and payment processing as a service. We also offer open banking and our recent service, um, My Carbon Action, which turns uh, geographical lifestyle and scientific data into climate action and awareness. Thank you. Less than a minute. Loving that. <laughs> now, Pekka. Okay, my name is Pekka Sivonen. I'm, I'm representing uh, Finnish Innovation Funding Agency Business Finland, which is a government uh, body to fund innovations in our uh, country about the volume of 700 million euros with the matching basis of private funding. Every euro that we spend, uh, two, uh, two euros approximately comes from private sector. So we have a huge impact into the Finnish society. I have a 30 years background as an entrepreneur in systems integration and mobile software and uh, have been working with the government uh, for five years uh, responsible for digital transformation of Finnish industries. Thanks, Becca. Glad to be here. And, and then the last member the, and the only one who was who not wearing a mask, so Hassan, <laughs> one minute brief for us. 
So ju 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 just to just to prove my compliance to rules, the mask is handy, but I'm in a <laughs> private space here, in a very beautiful location, uh, in, uh, in in Karachi, in the city of Karachi. So uh, P3 itself is a payment technology provider. So we set out with a mission. Uh, uh, mid-2014 to build what we call the payment system of the future. And so uh, our take on, on the, the world of the future is that there are a host of interactions and a number of those interactions culminate into transactions. So therefore, banks, insurance companies, service providers, uh, industry and enterprise all need a payment system capability at the heart so they can facilitate interactions and transactions. We're well on our way as a technology enabler, a technology provider uh, with customers uh, across Asia, uh, also uh, in the Middle East and uh, expanding fast. So thanks for having us on board with you. Great to have you all. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I have to say that I already love this, this panel because these are the first people who almost reached the one minute line. I've done this a couple of times. So. It's time to get things rolling here. Let's start by discussing a bit about the overall team, sustainability in, in fintech segment. Now, why is sustainability such a hot topic in fintech world right now? And let's start with you, Elon. Yes, uh, well, sustainability has become a very essential thing for, for all of the companies across different industries, uh, because of course now we have increased awareness about the topic, the urgency of this global issue. And I think uh, the customer demand is what making it kind of more more uh, urgent at this moment. There is a huge uh, gap in the available consumer knowledge. So what they could do in order to become more sustainable, how they could take steps uh, into more kind of uh, low carbon uh, lifestyles and so on. Uh, and 70% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions are attributed directly to the consumption. So we as individuals, uh, consumers, could really make a huge impact. And of course now we are demanding and we are lacking the tools to do so. So uh, there's already different solutions and services, uh, for example, in the, in the food industry. So you could uh, get the carbon footprint for specific product or, for example, uh, companies that are focusing on the uh, recycling uh, and uh, making uh, yarn of fire and so on. So I think that especially for the fintechs, so it's a it's a perfect position because we uh, could provide the holistic view to the consumers of what is their environmental impact of, of their actions. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. <coughs> true. And now Pekka and, and Hassan, what's what's your take on this? Yeah, sustainability definitely a major mega trend uh, of today and tomorrow. Uh, we've been uh, defining our new strategy for Business Finland uh, for time frame 2025, 2030, and it's all about sustainability. We will be sp basically spending all of our money in supporting sustainable ideas and technologies originating uh, from Finland, including fintech. And uh, if you look into the agenda of uh, European Commission and European Union for the next seven years, 2021, 20, 27 time frame, it's all about green deal and digital transformation of uh, industries. And these two things are very much uh, combined and intertwined. And uh, it's a twin transition for our continent. And Finland wants to be a forerunner, a thought leader for the continent and uh, a role model, basically. Europe wants to be a role model for the rest of the world. Finland wants to e evolve as the role model of Europe. Thanks, Becca. And Hassan? Yeah, so uh, from our uh, sort of thought process, our worldview, uh, sustainability is a, is a, is a, is a huge uh, subject uh, uh, matter. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big, uh, it's a big question it's a big concept to sort of internalize and translate so when we sort of went about looking at it uh, in, in in our place in the universe we sort of took direction from uh, the un's uh, uh, sustainable development goals the sdgs the 17 goals and uh, looking at what we do as a company and where we cut across uh, the 17 goals we find that we end up playing a role at tepo across multiple themes within the sdgs uh, we needed, uh, you know, some sort of absolute clarification in terms of what our impact would be. So the SDGs provided a very, very good framework from that point of view. And they cover, of course, as my uh, sort of colleagues there have talked about, they cover everything from climate to, to consumption. 
uh, the three themes that 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 we've uh, uh, considered heavily uh, within P3 in terms of our impact and what we want to do in terms of mainstreaming uh, are the environment, it's the social impact, as well as the economic impact. So, uh, uh, like I said at the beginning, when we set out to build P3, we see the world as interactions and transactions. And so we see that interactions have to be responsible, transactions has to, have to be responsible, and the, and, and, and the confluence of both of those coming together creates that sustainable lifestyle, not just from an individual's point of view, but from an ecosystem point of view. So that's, that's, that's our take on it, and that's where we're playing sort of our efforts in the overall global initiative. So very, very holistic view on, on, on this thing. I think we all agree that the, the mega trend thing here is, is the ma one of the main drivers. But I would like to ask you a question about the maturity of fintech industry. Many of these, these companies are relatively young. As we know, maybe the trend has been there for four or five years. I know that there has been fintech companies a lot longer. But how, how much do you think that these, uh, these maturing companies are actually, uh, do they have more possibilities to probe new kind of uh, revenue streams and, and uh, look outside of the box, so to say, on, uh, from, from fintech point of view? How do you see that? I will be using my divine powers to order somebody to answer. So let's start with you, Hassan. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, as, as, as entrepreneurs uh, and, and those that are involved in entrepreneurship and in, in, in startups and uh, sort of maturing uh, fintechs, uh, growth and scale companies, uh, you've got to start from the outside in, frankly speaking, and that's how we see the world again. As I, as I said, we've looked at the themes that from there we've tried to, tried to draw out our purpose, our mission and vision uh, of what we're seeking to achieve. So when you look at it from an outside in point of view, you've got to look at the value propositions you're taking to market. So the value propositions that you define need to solve a problem or fulfill a need which is in line with the values as a company that you've adopted. So if, like I said, our mission is very much focused around how do we create a, a, you know, a, 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 a positive impact on the environment? How do we create a better outcome from a societal and, and, and social uh, uh, point of view? How do we enable the economic activity uh, uh, for the micro merchant, but also the largest merchant out there. How do we do it within a geography? How do we do it cross border? So when you take the themes that are driving you and you're creating value propositions for the market, you then uh, translate that, you mainstream it yourself by the actual impact that your products and services will create in the market. So for me, it's not, a, uh, it's not an issue of whether it's a mature company or a new company or something that was formed recently. I think for us, uh, all of us that are involved in the uh, greater gambit of uh, financial technology, uh, you know, we've got to be very conscious of how we're designing and defining these value propositions. So age absolutely does not matter. Uh, you know, just uh, just be responsible, look at the impact and go for it. And I, I will, Elon, if you're not reaching out uh, for your microphone right now, I, I will be breaching this a little bit. So uh, what you said there, Hassan, um, a minute ago, uh, how, do, how do you see the situation on the market at the moment? What, what is happening there? And let's start with uh, both P3 and Enfuse. You have your own sustainability linked products on the market or, or holistically uh, sustainable products on the market. So Ilona, can you tell us a little bit about what you have created for the sustainable market in, in Enfuse? Yes, uh, My Carbon Action is a tool that helps consumers to get more insights on their um, everyday actions, so the environmental impact of, of every transaction that uh, they, they uh, make. Uh, end user can track uh, carbon footprint in six different categories, and also in addition to providing uh, insights on the environmental impact uh, of every transaction, we also would like to educate our customers, so we offer uh, 100 smart tips, which is different suggestions on how a user could uh, lower their daily uh, emissions. Uh, and we uh, offer this to the uh, offer turnkey solution to the banks, uh, fintech merchants, and 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 uh, getting back to what uh, Hassan said, I think that uh, the maturity really doesn't matter because we have, for example, traditional banks mm -hmm. part of our uh, customer base, and also uh, newcomers, different fintechs or or, or neo banks, 
and 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 for for all of them the sustainability is crucial part and especially for the traditional banks of course now you can already see how some of them has taken kind of big steps towards being more responsible they have set uh, goals for the company and for, for for ones who don't they become soon quite irrelevant to the consumers and then if we think about the fintechs or the nia banks who are just coming to the market uh, they all breathe sustainability so they just uh, cannot even uh, be without so it's kind of right to exist uh, for them so they want to support uh, customers to adopt a lower uh, low carbon lifestyle they also want to support uh, companies to reduce their emissions and and uh, enfuse is, is an interesting and what i tried to reach out um, there earlier and probably failed b badly thank you hasn't for saving me there uh, but exactly like you said uh, enfuse had business before you created this service so your your roots are in in more traditional fintech side, and then you have expanded to the sustainable side, right? Yes, exactly. So we offer our card issuing and payment processing as a service, and also open banking. And uh, sustainability has been one of our core values since uh, its beginning. And of course, then we thought, uh, based what I already mentioned earlier, so 70% of greenhouse gas emissions are directly attributed to the consumption. And then we thought that. Uh, if you really would like to lower your individual carbon footprint, you need to be able to measure it based on the actual consumption. And that's what, uh, where we come at the perfect fit, because we, are, uh, we have a license to store and process uh, transaction data, uh, customer account information, so we are able to, to calculate the carbon uh, footprint on very detailed level. Yes, and Hasan, you have a bit more holistic view on, on this, on, on P3. Yeah, so... so Again, you know, I, I go back to our roots of, of when we were setting up the company in the in, in September 2014. You know, we looked at we looked at it more from a from a global problem point of view, and and so the company was actually born global. The first customer was signed in Thailand, as opposed to in Finland. So uh, and 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 so again, our sort of how we've been translating our propositions in line with the themes that we follow into the impact that we create. Uh, uh, you know, for us, as an example, financial inclusion is is a major theme in mm -hmm. the company, and that is what we're driving with the outcomes we create. So, uh, uh, as as you said earlier, I'm in Pakistan at the moment. I'm in the city of Karachi. This is the financial hub of the of the country. 200 million people. Uh, there are two very interesting things the company is doing here. Uh, we're building out a traditional bank into a complete digital bank, uh, and that digital bank uh, soup to nuts, uh, all aspects of it, and that digital bank is due to go live in, in December, which is why I could not take uh, a flight back to be there with you guys. And the bank, uh, that, you know, which is which is uh, has taken a very bold step, I have to say, in the right direction, is a very successful trade and corporate services bank, which also offers. Uh, consumer and retail banking, but then they've said, you know what, we're going to go and, and, and do something much, much bigger, exponential reach and scale with the right type of uh, digitalization uh, capability, which is what B3 brings in to address 18 to 30 market segment. And a big chunk of them are not part of the financial uh, 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 sort of circle. So how do we create financial inclusion? How do we bring more and more people, millions of people, into that financial services circle so that economic impact, social benefits, and of course, uh, uh, where, where you have the ability to live more responsibly, you have the means, then of course you think about the clim climatic impact as well. But if you're on subsistence and you're, you know, you, uh, you, the difference is, are you gonna have a meal at the end of the day or not? People wouldn't think about some of those higher, higher value actions. So for us, uh, I'm going to take an extra minute here for us, being a Finnish company, coming out of Finland, having those Finnish values that are imbued into the way we think, uh, the life that we live out there, and I'm very happy that uh, I participate in that life after having lived in Singapore, the UK, and so forth, uh, that it's a social, uh, uh, it's a very uh, conscious society in terms of its impact. Right, the, the 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 societal awareness is very high, and it's those values that we are trying to globalize wherever we can have that impact. Uh, uh, there is another thing that we're doing quite large in terms of commerce. I'll talk about that later. Thank you. I really appreciate that because I, I was about to give you a ban. So <laughs> now, Pekka has been uh, awfully quiet for a long time, and this is directed uh, straight to you. 
So basically, some people have been talking about what, what uh, Hassan actually referred here a little bit, that the, that the Nordic region, Finland, among uh, the Nordic countries here, is, is turning into a hotbed for sustainable fintech solutions. Do you agree with this statement? And if you do, what, what are the drivers that, that make it possible? Absolutely. I think uh, what's unique in the Nordic countries, and especially in Finland, is the, the ecosystem kind of thinking where we facilitate mechanisms with our funding uh, uh, to, to bring in big and small companies together to tackle bigger challenges. And uh, the kind of uh, disruptive thinking and exponential thinking that Hassan gave us an example is exactly what we are looking for because there's a lot of opportunities evolving, uh, globally speaking, uh, for the fintech sector. And uh, I would uh, stress and emphasize everybody in their mind to make out mind map of a scenario how the end game in this fintech sector will look like when you add the Chinese players you put the central bank of China you put uh, Alibaba Tencent and uh, the aggressive sustainability and climate agenda that China has so that's the likely direction of the competition that you everybody hearing this will have and at least they will be for sure part of the end game you should figure out the map, who do I need to partner with in order to be able to compete in that or even still exist during the times of this, when this uh, end game takes place. Uh, Nordic countries uh, have a great amount uh, of uh, knowledge in uh, mobile communications, mobile software. Everything in our life is going to happen in mobile anyways. And uh, this is exactly the reason why Nordics are emerging uh, as a hotbed in this technology. This is the home of Nokia and Ericsson, and uh, mobile communications is everywhere in, in, in our lives. So there, there are definitely a lot of factors that are, are drivers. What about our entrepreneurs? Uh, what about Enfuse? What about P3? Be quick, raise some things that are really well here in Finland from FinTech point of view. Uh, well, I think that um if we think about sustainability topic, the consumers here, uh, so the end user, I think they're all sustainability oriented. That's the per per perfect market to kind of uh, launch and test different solutions because people are, of course, they are more aware about the, the global issue. They also are more educated uh, on some in some extent and also they believe uh, what, what scientists uh, tol tell them. So I think that's, that's very important uh, part o of those. So the kind of market readiness is very good here. And Hasan, you, you have jumped from, from Finnish soil uh, directly to global competition and, and global customers, but what are, what are the key factors from your point of view? You could have your headquarters anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we could have, when we were setting up the company, uh, it of course helps uh, my, my, my university sweetheart that I, that I married in 1996 is a Finn. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've lived everywhere around the world together. And then when it was uh, the time to set up P3, you know, the options we had were Singapore, which I think was a superb choice, and uh, we could have definitely done it. But at the same time, I was very inspired by the annual holidays, uh, winter or summer, uh, depending on the year, in Finland, and what I came to know of the Finnish people and how, how things, uh, things are there. And so I can share my view as, as a non-local uh, to yourselves, as someone who's, who's an outs outsider. My view is that I see, and this is important to the point of the opportunity uh, in the Nordics for the fintechs, I see Finland as the top of the world. You're physically actually on the top of the world. And you're also an example of the good life when, when humanity at large thinks about what, what good life should be all about. So, so it's already happening in your country. And, uh, and uh, I have to say the Finns as a nation have done a superb job. Uh, your people at large, as well as your government, has done a superb job of creating that very viable environment. Now, now when I wanted to build P3, I needed to be in an environment where I could be inspired. And, and so now everyone in the company is literally looking at 
the way things work in Finland, uh, you just look at aspects of financial inclusion. You look at uh, equality. You look at economic access. These are all, again, tying back to the sustainable uh, uh, development goals of, of the UN. And when we see these things working and we live and breathe in that environment, it allows us to create those value propositions and also take them credibly to the world. So if I did exactly the same thing, as an example, in some other part of the world, uh, you know, where those values are not alive, it's very difficult to internalize, live, breathe them and make them part of your convictions to take them to market. So I would my message to all fintechs out there is that you're in the right sort of you're in the right live lab already. Utilize that, learn from there, create value propositions that solve problems and fulfill needs around the world, which is exactly what we're doing. And that's the opportunity for everyone. Thanks. And, and following that topic a little bit now, now we were talking a lot of good things about Nordics and, 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 and Finland here. But if we look the Nordics as a market from from fintech point of view, this might be a good place to start a company, but is this a good place to market your services, your products, or should? Well, where, where is the magic happening in the world of fintech nowadays? So, Ilona, how do how do you see that situation from your company's point of view? Yes, I think like on a global level, a lot of the companies are now uh, t- talking about the sustainability. That's kind of given, mm-hmm. but uh, who actually act on it? Uh, so there are still uh, quite quite few examples, especially if we think about like the fintech world and whether they, f- for example, offer some carbon footprint calculation or carbon offsetting and so on. So I really want to see more uh, in the Nordics as well. But uh, And I'm very interested to, to, to hear about um, um, uh, others' examples, but based on our experience, we have seen huge interest in the Netherlands and UK. Mm-hmm. So those are the markets who are actually taking huge steps. They are really already on top of the edge and they are uh, de- a lot of the research, different testing and proof of concepts of solutions. So they're uh, really taking this forward. Where then again, especially in the banking sector, for example, in the Nordics, uh, banks are waiting and kind of taking a look at who is going to be the next, probably outside of the Nordics. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I really hope that that uh, the Nord- Nordics uh, companies and, and, and uh, fintechs will, will kind of uh, become more braver and, and start acting on it quite soon. I don't know if you know this, but I'm from a bank, so <laughs> I, I kind of felt that. But Pekka, how, how do you see? Let's talk the after <laughs> this panel. <laughs> uh, Pekka, how do you feel the uh, see the situation? Uh, the tech savviness of the people in the Nordics uh, is very high. This is an uh, excellent and um, probably the best test lab for uh, launching new services because people people take them very very easily, and the reception is good. But then. Uh, for the companies, that's not big of a too uh, big enough uh, of a market uh, area because we are basically just 30 plus million people, which is half of the size of California, state of California, and uh, but very condensed area, very focused on on R and D, uh, very high education system, producing new engineers, uh, architects, etc. Uh, for the demand. Ob- Obviously, Finland, since we got more than 10,000 people that were released a uh, few years back from, from Nokia, there's a great availability of talent here, and we are attracting a lot of more talent to, to Finland to support the, the demand the com- for, of the companies uh, uh, for new, new talent that are uh, willing to grow here. But then you need to partner with uh, 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 companies coming from elsewhere, having a footprint in other geographics. And that's what we need to see happening next. Now we're almost out of time. And I have one more question for all of you, but be really quick. So a uh, quick last round here. What is the key factor of creating a successful, sustainable fintech product or service? What would be the top one thing that you would uh, like to take into account? And Ilona, start. Yes, uh, for us it's uh, transparency and also uh, scientific uh, um, 
base. Uh, so it should be strong because, of course, there now have been a lot of the discussions and also speculations around the sustainability, greenwashing and so on. So, of course, uh, for the companies, it's very important to ensure that if they uh, uh, provide, for example, the carbon footprint calculation tools to the consumers, so they are based on the reliable calculation methods. And then, of course, for the, for the end users, they need to be insured as well on the other end that when they see the carbon footprint for 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 some specific product it is what it is and it's it based on the scientific research so i think it's 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 crucial at this point especially when we are kind of doing uh, new services and uh, around the sustainability it's it's important to establish this trust between uh, end users and, and companies and i will stop you there excellent answer hassan how do you see this one thing that you would like to raise yeah, I think uh, uh, the the common deno denominator, regardless of where you are globally, is is the the end user. Think of human centric approach. What is the who is the individual that will benefit or will 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 solve a problem using your product or service? So the need you fulfill the problem you solve. Keep that individual in mind because their context is different market by market. In Finland, our context is different to, as an example, the context in, in Pakistan or some, some, let's even say, some parts of the U.S. So keep the individual, the final beneficiary in mind. Loving that. And then Pekka. I would say that um, the world is in a situation where it screams for ecosystemic thinking, uh, partnership like collaboration with disruptive ideas. We've been seeing over the last two decades um, private-public partnerships. We need to add a fourth pillar, including people into our thinking, whatever business we are in, and uh, that's the uh, secret sauce uh, for success going forward. Secret sauce. Thanks, thanks, Pekka. Uh, all right, all right. A lot of things squeezed in very, very short time and uh, in one panel discussion. Many things were covered and uh, many, many, many questions still out there waiting to be answered. Do not hesitate to be in touch uh, with the organizers here. They can probably get you in, in touch with uh, Hasan, Ilona, Enfuse, P3, Business Finland and Pekka. So if you have any questions, I believe that our, our guests today are more than happy to answer these. So I would like to thank our panelists for participating. Uh, this was a great opportunity for me to learn more. And huge thanks for our audience as well. Have a nice day. Interesting discussion. So we have today talked about software as a service and city as a service. Next, we will talk about mobility as a service, which is of course tightly related to today's theme, which is sustainability. Next, we have Sampo Hiatanen, the CEO and founder of Mass Global, explaining how digital platforms are enabling sustainability in mobility. Hello everyone, my name is Sampo Hietanen. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Mass Global. We're known of a mobile app called WIM, which is the world's first mobility as a service uh, app or, or company itself. Um, mobility as a service is a concept uh, I'm known as a father of, but it's actually born right here behind you in, in Finland, in Helsinki. It tells a lot how the disruption and how, how transportation or mobility will look like after the digital transformation. I'm here to tell about how these platforms actually enable the change. They're not the change itself, but they enable quite a lot, a different thinking. You may have seen in Singapore Straight Times or many other media about this. And the reason is quite simple. Why, why would there be Bloomberg's or Wall Street Journal's or Forbes writing about a uh, a concept born in a small country like Finland, uh, born in a small company. And the reason is quite, quite simple and has to do with asking questions. Oftentimes when we talk about digitalization, we talk about technology quite a lot, but not really what does it do. It enables a lot, but then sometimes it's not so much about uh, finding the answer, it's about asking the right questions. 
And for us, this means daring to ask, and I, I would really argue the biggest question of our times, both for productivity gains means economic growth, but definitely for sustainability. And that question is this simple. What would it take for you, for an individual, to really give up their own cars? What would it take for you? What would I here today have to promise so that you would give up your car? We exist to be better than car ownership for at least a million persons by 2030. This doesn't happen by ideology. This happens through service, through design, through actually using the technology for something that is better for people. What does it mean? We often plan cities and everything for the archetype here, you see above, uh, car taking you from A to B. We would love to maybe say that, okay, shouldn't we be, des be designing for something that you see below there? And which one of the, these are, are more right? And the real answer is neither one or both of them. Because we're not one people. We're not always wanting to do it this way or we're not wanting to do it that way. If we really want to illustrate the new world of mobility, it looks a bit more like this. We have options taking the car. We have options of taking the bike. We have options of walking, using a car, bus, park, all of these things. But the reality of, of these is often described this way. We see the archetypes of, of different mobility in a way that you have a taxi ride. You plan, you hail, you ride, you pay, you arrive. Or you do, a, you do something with a cycle, you bike. You walk, unlock, cycle, lock, and arrive. And this is what we plan for. But the reality, if we really go after the experience of, of car ownership, if we really want to design, this is what we have to deal with. This is what we are designing. It's booking, boarding, uh, having been rerouted, fueling, queuing, reserving, having road rage, uh, seeding, finding something your way in signals, being in hubs and all of this. To really design for life of really making this, it is about simplicity. And this is what digitalization should be about. Not about technology at hand, but actually making things simple. Our competition is extremely good. It's well designed, it's easy, it's convenient. Having your own car loyally waiting for you right there. If we want to make it, we need everything else. In a way, we are your skeleton key to your city. We need routing to be there. We need planning, we need ticketing, we need payments. We need all kinds of different ways of buying this, even as like you do with the Netflix, as a subscription of everything there, and even worldwide. The theme of digitalization and what we need to be enabling for people is quite simple. I've been around the world, including Singapore many times, whether it's in LA or Tokyo or, or in Paris. And when I ask really people, what would I here have to promise so that you would give up your car? And of course, give me the same money. What would be as valuable as that? They always say the same thing. And it is, if I could promise, really promise, anywhere, anytime, on a whim, just like that, without any planning. And if I can deliver, okay, then I'll think about it. What it then really needs is, is for us to have all of these together. What do you really want also as convenience? Yes, car is a part of it, but instead of owning a car that you use about 4% of the time, you have a garage full of cars. You need everything handy there in a convenient way. Mobility is something that we all uh, are using roughly about 71 minutes per day. We use that a lot. We want the convenience. We want that freedom. This thing of sustainable mobility will not be solved by just efficiency. It has to be a part of that, like the T Ford used to be. But it is solved by solving people's or fulfilling people's dreams. And the dream of freedom of mobility is just so strong that we have to find something that is as lucrative as owning a car. Now, is this a big issue? I, I claimed there that this is the biggest, uh, biggest question we're asking, what would be more valuable than owning a car, uh, will be a biggest driver for world economic growth. And, and I argue this is true. If we think that about 20% of household budget is transportation, is mobility, the average revenue per user, if we, if we compare this with the revolution that happened in telecom industry when the mobile phones hit this, and we see a completely different field now with innovations and everything, we're talking about 10 times as big ARPU, the average revenue per user here. Out of that value, 76% of people's money lie on an asset, car, 
that is used about 4% of the time. Now, if anybody out there shows or, or can tell me a bigger way of, of productivity gains for a productivity leap, please do, but there isn't any. So of course, if someone will solve this. This will be solved. And actually, we are solving it as we speak. As to, as to sustainability, uh, transport or mobility is the only sector that hasn't improved since the 90s. Car has, cars have improved a lot, but the overall emissions, they've stayed stable, stable or even grown. The only industry that's that. Today, we account for 25% of carbon emissions. By 2030, it appears that mobility will be 40% of all the emissions. We all understand this cannot be accepted. But we cannot solve this without bringing something as lucrative to people, solving their freedom. Otherwise, it's going to be a struggle. Trying to restrict them is, is never the best way of solving things. We have to if there's no other way. <clears throat> At the same time, we have made a study of quite an extensive study in European big cities. Today, today, 38% of, of car owners, they would give up their car if they have something like what we're, what we're bringing, uh, a convenient subscription for everyone with access to everything. So that means today alone, 70 million cars are waiting to be replaced. All we need to do is use the digitalization, use these platforms, use these to actually actually capture the value of about $10 trillion or euro market that is out there. It is a relatively big issue that we are solving. Now, here's the good news. <clears throat> Why the digital platforms or, or digitalization can actually solve this issue? It is because the components to compare or compete with car ownership and that means that I have to have public transport, the taxi-like services, ride hails, uh, micro-mobility, car shares, car rentals, even the, even the ferries here in Helsinki need to be part of that to be able to fulfill that dream of, of, of freedom of mobility. The good, good news is they do exist. Those physical investments to create the create the scenario that compares with car ownership, they exist. Whether I am in Rio de Janeiro or, or Singapore, the public transport, the taxis, the car shares, the car rentals, actually the supply is growing. All we have to do is digitally combine them and find the next big dream for people. And the next big dream for people, if I ask anywhere, is what if I told you with the same money that you're spending in your car every month, I will give you access to all world's, all world's buses, trains, metros, taxis, car shares, scooters, bikes, whatever you can think of. Not just here, but when you're in New York, the same applies. And that starts to be a dream, because what the car was actually providing is the world open for us. But that world is limited to how much we're willing to drive. But if instead I say, same money, the whole world, and that's when you start dreaming. And this is all about dreams. Here's the hard part. Mobility is big. This is where digitalization comes to, comes to play. Um, we all need to understand that this ecosystem will not be owned by anyone. This really is an ecosystem, not an ego system. We also have this kind of a, let's say, platform economy 1.0 thought that somebody will be in a bottleneck position and, and somehow control this ecosystem. It's not going to happen in mobility. The cities, the governments will not allow one player to rule it all. This is not possible in, in a field like this. The only, the only thing, and this is why, why we need also the governments and cities in this play, is to make up the game rules. Really make it into an ecosystem. What we need to get is all the resources to actually compete with the dream of mobility. This is funny because whenever I talk, whether it's in Singapore or somewhere else, and I talk to normal people, and by normal people, I mean people that are not in mobility industry. They say, of course, my mobility, just like Netflix, every access to everything, obvious. This is how it always should have been. This is how I would like it. And then they say, this is actually not a rocket science. Why isn't it here yet? But it is because it's such a big, big industry where everybody seeks for control and we don't have the game rules yet. The platform rules are actually the biggest innovations in this. Eventually, this is what we all should be aspiring and should be a dream for all of us, that we can also live exactly the life you want with the same quality that you, you have now, but without the need 
of owning a car. If you really think, and, and this is something I need to debug immediately in the end, that you might be thinking there, especially, and I get to blame us because I'm a 40 plus man, I tend to get this, and if, if we were now uh, live in Singapore, over cocktails, someone uh, with over, over 40 men would come to me and, and knock and say, well, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe they're in Finland, but, you know, we Singapore, we Australians, we Americans, we love to own our cars. And that's actually not true. That may be true for 40, 50 plus men, but if you look at the ones that we're building the future for, the 20 plus, they don't really love it. Look at Stockholm, where only 9% of the youngsters even get a driver's license. They will eventually, because their living standard is not good when they're suburbanized with two kids, because we didn't design this for them. Now we have a chance to do it. But there's even a chance that gave me a heart attack. We just got a five-star rating a while ago in, uh, in App Store from a 50-plus man who said that he's been using the BMWs and Mercedes for about 40 years of his life and now has given a chance for subscription, a mobility subscription, mass, if you want, uh, and he's already exceeded all his expectations. So look, if there's hope for 50, 40 plus men, there's hope for the world as well. But what it needs is co collaboration, game rules, utilizing the digitalization, not taking it as, as something that is self-servant. We need to use it to answer the question, what would be better than owning a car. Thank you. Thank you, Sampo. And for the last time today, we'll have a comment and perhaps a joke from Paul and Ville. Thank you, Janne, and welcome back to the studio here in Espoo, Finland. Uh, Sampo there just painted a picture uh, of mobility as a service, and I gotta say, I love this. Uh, he also talked about dreams, uh, which was fun. Uh, perhaps not daydreams like we are uh, here uh, in our podcast, but uh, the only question I have uh, in my mind right now is that, does this mean that I finally get to drive a Porsche? Uh, Paul, uh, you actually do drive a Porsche uh, and uh, you're even a race, car, a race car driver. You race the Porsches as well. So what do you think? Uh, is it okay to drive an electric scooter for a moment uh, between races? <laughs> well, well, um, you're always welcome to borrow the keys to, to my Porsche. You know that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Close friends and, and all that. But Villa, uh, as, as long as you... Um, Promise not to crash it, right? Because I have seen you driving. Oh, <laughs> not fair. <laughs> but, <sighs> but all jokes aside, I do like the idea and strongly support it. I, I would be delighted, actually, to uh, to not have the fixed cost of uh, car ownership, and and would get rid of of my car, even the Porsches, in an instant if a better and more economical option was available. But I wonder if the service is mature enough today, as I do not live in the centre, I mean, I live out here in, in the outskirts uh, in Espo, um, I, I would still probably find the options of not owning a car to be quite restrictive, particularly with kids, um, etc., right? you have an awful lot of ad hoc things that happen and, and you can't always plan everything. Okay, if you can press a button and the car turns up in two minutes, but um, if, if if it takes longer, then it's probably an issue. Uh, but as the mobility as a service domain expands and gets more mature, I am sure I will handle and give away the keys to my car, finding a better use for my garage space. Um, now, car racing as a service, <laughs> that, I think, sounds like a great idea. Maybe I need to uh, convince Sampo to, to consider expanding his app into including uh, car racing as a service. Uh, but what about you, Villa? Um, you're already releasing a car, right? Yep. 
yeah. w would you would you be happy? What would it take for you to hand away uh, the keys and not have a key to a car in your hand all the time? Well, in a way, the mobile phone can be a key to your car. Uh, so as long as you have the kind of permission set up in your phone, in your digi digital kind of uh, identity, then it already acts like a key. But I think I find the current leasing model is actually quite restrictive uh, because mm. what I'm doing is I'm paying a monthly fee, which is the same every month. Uh, but uh, I would much rather be uh, be paying uh, for the actual usage of the asset uh, that I'm uh, that I'm using, of course. And more interestingly, uh, I would be delighted if I could pay based on how I use uh, this my my car. So, for example, if I'm if I'm driving like a madman like you, uh, <laughs> then uh, then I pay a little bit more uh, for the same kilometers that that I'm if I'm driving uh, economically friendly and sustainably and safely, mm -hmm. uh, I could actually pay a little less, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So I think these these models are interesting, and indeed I've been working on this uh, on these models uh, in my in my day job uh, as well, and uh, the uh, the name of the project is that Villa needs a Tesla, so. So <laughs> I like that. I yeah, like that. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, still hasn't materialized. I still don't have a Tesla, unfortunately, but maybe one day. But maybe you do day. know that Porsche do make an electric car now. They do. They yes. do. So there's a be uh, best of both worlds uh, right there. Yeah. Awesome. And just in case you didn't get uh, enough of random fintech chit chat and commentary, uh, please check out our podcast, Fintech Daydreaming. Uh, on all the usual platforms to hear more uh, of this random fintech comment. And don't forget that you can also reach us on fintechdaydreaming.com as well as on LinkedIn and Twitter. That is all from us uh, for this great fintech festival. This is Fintech Daydreaming signing off and back to you, Yana. Excellent, and now the moment we have all been waiting for, the announcement of the revolutionary Finnish fintech of 2020. And for that, we have one of the judges here, Rikka Salminen, the country head of Finland, Sweden, and the Belt Baltics from Visa. Hi. And as a reminder, the other judges were Toby Lywood from Ox Venture Capital and Andre Rodin from BNP Paribas. Please, Rikka, go ahead. Thank you, and thanks for this honor. It's a pleasure to be in this, this panel and jury to select the next uh, Finnish um, revolutionary Finnish fintech of the year. Uh, this year, I think all the five uh, finalists and the pitching, it went so well. We were superbly impressed about the quality. They were all very different, um, but we really, um, I think we were overwhelmed about the, the winner in terms of how they captured um, the market and they have done something that nobody's done before, uh, at least not in, 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 in this country. And we looked into the, the vision, um, entrepreneurship, innovation and scalability. And after very tight discussions, and actually we had to vote within the, the jury members, we finally came to a joint conclusion that, with further notice, the next revolutionary Finnish FinTech of the year is tomorrow tech and Diaz. Absolutely amazing job what they've done in Finland. And we believe that what they've done really in the real estate world is absolutely something that's going to fly, not only in this country, but in the Nordics and potentially in Europe and globally. So that is our choice. Thank you, Rikka. And huge congratulations to the winner, Tomorrow Tech and Diaz. The trophy is trophy yours. The trophy is here. So congratulations from all of us in the panel and jury. All right, so that was all from Finland. And remember, if you're interested in the Finnish fintech industry, please get in touch with us. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the fintech week. Thank you, and congratulations again. <laughs>